Greetings, friends, and my cyborg enemies. Today, we are reviewing something that has been on my docket for a while. I ordered it for pre-order pretty much right when it came out because I was really excited to see what this author could put out in terms of literary quality, and for the most part, she did not disappoint. Meg Latour's The Cyborg Tinker. Like I said, I wanted to check this out pretty much right when it got announced because I followed Meg's YouTube channel almost right from when she started it, and I've gotten a lot of advice from her, especially on the literary world, on what the differences are between traditional publishing and self-publishing, and I have a lot of respect for her. I think she's uh, I think she's bright, and I respect that she is on a mission to help people with information that she that you know it's hard to find some place else's, that it's hard to find some other places. And uh, so I really wanted to buy her book and check out check out her her artistic stylings and uh, like I said, <laughs> not disappointed. So for those of you who have no idea what the cyborg tinker is about, the gist is this: we have a main character who gets swept up and recruited by a cyborg circus, and she gets swept away down this plot hole of uh, fantastical happenings. There's a big deadly competition and they're going to go perform for this emperor who enacted a cyborg prohibition. And um, the entire time we have subplots going, there's a big romance subplot that's like a main, it's, it's damn near intertwined with the main plot, it's so important. And the entire thing is just very fantastical and fast moving. Like I said, the book is pretty damn good. Obviously not perfect, but very good. I do have a few things that I want to nitpick about at the end, but before that we're going to give it the praise it deserves. First of all, <laughs> Meg has done a really good job of taking this fairy tale, fantastical, Studio Ghibli-esque setting and blending it with adult themes. This is not a book for kids. Despite the fact that it very much reads like a fairy tale, it is not a book for kids or even young adults. I'd, I'd say 18 and up. <laughs> I, I would not let my 12 year old read this book. <laughs> lots lots of, uh, lots of uh, adult themes in terms of violence and sexuality both. So spicy I had to get a drink of water. The other thing that Meg has done really nicely here is she's blended a few genres it has some sci-fi elements and it's very steampunk and like i said it's very fairy tale and it's a wonderful mishmashing of all the best things out of these genres um probably the least of which is sci-fi and i say that because there are some things in it that i'm just like that doesn't really hold up under any kind of scientific scrutiny but Meg I don't think Meg was going for any kind of a serious science fiction audience here it really was you know a, a new fantastical world and um, I don't think we're supposed to be holding much of this up under scientific scrutiny so <laughs> that's not really a legitimate bitch uh, so I'm gonna let that one go moving right along her characters are really good um, it's not the way I would write them, but it's obviously not my book. But her characters are good. Gwendolyn Grimm, the main protagonist, is a delightfully, slightly salty sweet kind of character. She's a cyborg tinkerer. She starts off as a ship tinkerer. And she's a great female protagonist. I really like her. She's sassy. She's smart. Um, I've read better female protagonists but I've read worse female protagonists. So Gwendolyn Grimm definitely holds up to muster. I definitely like what she's got going on. The male protagonist, Bastion, and I hope I'm saying his name right. I'm not sure if it's Bastion or Bastian. Um, Meg, feel free to correct me on that one. Uh, holds up under scrutiny as well. In fact, I like him better than Gwendolyn Grimm. I think he is sympathetic and noble and misunderstood and that's partially his own fault he deliberately projects an image for certain reasons um, but I think he is a very noble and respectable man I I love Bastion Kaber he's he's a good guy 
Our third primary protagonist is a girl by the name of Rora, and she's uh, a little bit devious, and she's not exactly on the up and up for some of the story, but her motivations are understandable, and she's never outright malicious. And she has a big change of heart at the end of the book, which kind of brings her all the way into the uh, being on the up and up side of things. And overall, um, I, I think she's a fine character in terms of, uh, you know, liking her and her moral alignment. I like her. And she's also well written and fairly complex. Uh, so, yeah, Rora, Rora's okay in my book. Our villain is actually the mistress of this circus. And I don't want to give too many spoilers away here, but. It's a pretty interesting turn of events by the end of the book, and it's one you didn't really see coming, not explicitly, but if you were really good at sussing things out, you might have been able to see it coming, but I didn't. So good job, Meg. And then besides that, the settings were absolutely great. Like I said, they very they feel very fantastical. You have a, a, a ship that sails through the solar system with literal sails. It looks like, I mean, it looks, it's described pretty much like the ship on the cover. And that's very fantastical and it really lends itself to this fairy tale theme, this very um, fantastical landscape that we're trying to be immersed in. Um, in terms of the steampunk setting, we get plenty of stuff to support that, right down from, from the technology to the settings to even even the way people are kind of described as dressing um, a lot of the time is very steampunk. So this is definitely a very steampunk fairy tale and it's it it, it really it, it, it's good. <laughs> it's good. But as I said, the book is not perfect. There's a few nitpicky little things that as a reader personally bug me. These are just things I look for. These are things I care about. You might not necessarily let me know in the comments if these kinds of things bug you in books, but without further ado, let's get into those nitpicky little gripes. So the first one that kind of got to me was when the ringleader, Bastion Kaburr, recruits Gwendolyn Grimm for the circus. He bails her out of jail, but he didn't send anyone to her hotel room to grab her stuff. And that bugged me initially, and it only bugged me more as the story went on, because he's the kind of guy who would absolutely do that. Now, the argument against that happening would be that there was a time constraint factor, and that would be a fairly reasonable explanation. So it's not a hard, aching, oh my god, why thing, especially because, you know, it's just personal possessions. It's not like a big, huge factor in the story anyways. I just have a thing about my stuff in real life, and I extend that to the characters I care about. I'm like, oh no, their stuff. Who's going to take care of their stuff? <laughs> so... So when characters that I like lose a bunch of their stuff, I'm like, ah, oh, man, that sucks. I would hate that. So that one bugged me a little bit. Another thing that struck me as odd was these cyborg implants that so many of these characters have. Every character in the cyborg circus certainly has. They're described as being extremely valuable. Each one, even a minor implant, is described as being worth a fortune. And... During the course of the book, the mistress of the circus takes some actions that put these implants in serious jeopardy. I mean, just of being completely destroyed, turned into scrap metal. And that doesn't make sense from a financial and resource perspective, because new implants are illegal to manufacture now. And the reason we find out for some of the main events in this book at the end, the bit, one of the big twists at the end, it doesn't make sense for that twist because she would want as many of the implants to be intact as possible for that twist to be facilitated. So that kind of struck me as being a little bit out of character or perhaps being out of line with her motivations. But then it's very clear that she's also a little bit crazy. 
she's been kind of driven crazy by this uh, desire for, well, I'm not going to spoil, but she's she's been driven a little bit crazy. So it stands to reason that, yeah, maybe she's not, uh, maybe she's not considering everything 100%. Another little thing that bugged me, and this is more so on the sci-fi side of things, so you can really let it go because we're in a fantastical setting, but I'm just going to mention it because the sci-fi people might pick up on this and be a little bit um, aggrieved, and I'm more of a sci-fi head than I am a fantasy head, so I'm just going to bring it up. So the cyborg implants all have an interface chip that runs up to your brain. And these chips create an interface between your brain and your implant so that they work perfectly, you know. And on the surface, that makes sense. But when you look at real-world technology for prosthetics that are beginning to pop up, we see that we don't actually need anything like that. If you look at the real-world robotic prosthetics that are going to be on market any day now, I mean, it's really cutting-edge stuff. It's fascinating. Go check it out if you have the time. We see that you don't need any such chip because those prosthetics can use the nerve signals that exist in the limb that's left. So say my hand was lopped off, they don't need to run wires to a control chip up to my brain. They can use the nerve signals that exist in my forearm to power my robotic hand. All the robotic hand needs is a battery and the nerve signals that exist in my forearm from healthy nerves that are that survived the loss of my hand and so that kind of bugged me because we're in kind of a you know like I said it has some sci-fi elements but it's so fantastical I have to let it go so you get a pass on that one Meg your book isn't supposed to be hard science fiction I get it you get a pass all right that's just me being nitpicky because sci-fi is my shit <laughs> there's also two things that were utterly predictable and i mean i when i say utterly predictable i mean i called them almost right away with like this book is 400 pages and i called both of these within the first 100 pages and you don't find out for sure until like page 350 380 i mean i just i sniffed it out like that and that is something about um, the forgetting, which is a plot element in the book, and the Watchmen, which is a group who are basically the security guards of the circus. Um, I'm not going to go into exactly what they are because I don't want to give spoilers out, but I, I called it right away. <laughs> um, so it is what it is on that one. And the last little thing that I would nitpick about is that there's a final scene near the end of the book where some guns are fired and a gravitational field is released and so the bullets don't hit the people they were fired at and they just start floating up. And that's not how gravity works. The bullet was pushed by the propellant out of the gun. It would continue flying in that direction. In fact, it would actually now fly much further, potentially forever through space, because now gravity isn't pulling it down and slowing it down. And if it left the atmosphere it was in to the vacuum of space, it would have just kept going at that same speed forever because it would have no resistance, no gravity working against it. So the characters at the end of the book, the protagonists, should be dead because they had a hail of bullets fired at them that ending a gravitational field would not have stopped. That's the biggest science-based bitch that I have. And I can't let that one go because the gravity in this book works like gravity anywhere, you know, in the real world. And so I just can't let that one go. It's not how gravity works. That's not how uh, ballistic science works. <laughs> but like I said, overall, the book is very fun, very fantastical, lovable characters, very... Uh, mature handling of some very delicate situations and some subversion of romantic tropes and very steamy adult scenes. So I give the book a 4 out of 5, uh, an 8, a 9 out of 10, 
And uh, if you like adult content, if you like fairy tales, if you like steampunk, check it out. Megalotors, The Cyborg Tinker is a good book. It's damn near a great book. I just, uh, it's not my genre. And so I can't quite say great, but that's only a matter of personal preference because it is well written and it's a good story and I enjoyed it thoroughly. So I hope you enjoyed my review of the Cyborg Tinker. Stay tuned on my channel for Ready Player Two. I'm going to be reviewing that very promptly because I nitpicked the first little section because I wanted to check it out and I really enjoyed it. Um, I also have more author interviews coming up as always, as well as an advice video, and I have more of those planned as well. Like, subscribe, comment, do all the YouTube things. Be well, my friends. I'll see you guys next time.